Okay, if you could turn your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Um, we're going to be reading there in a minute. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this book. You guys ever read this book before? No? Maybe it's a, might be, um, maybe it's not as well known or whatever. It's called There Was an Old Lady Who Swallowed the Fly. It's a very weird book. Um, if you're familiar with it, it's, it's a, it is a strange book. She Swallows a Fly. I'm not going to read it to you because it's not, this isn't nursery, but she swallowed a fly, and it's like, why she swallow the fly? So what she does is she swallows other things to eat the other things. She swallows a spider to eat the fly, and then a bird to eat the spider, and then it goes on and goes on, and she continually is swallowing all kinds of weird stuff until at the end of the book, she swallows a horse, and she dies. <laughs> it's, it's a very weird book. I was thinking about that book last week, actually, um, and it's a very good analogy of what we sometimes do to ourselves. We might make a small slip up. We might make a mistake in our lives, and what do we do instead of making it right? And I mean, if she had just left the fly alone, it probably would have just digested and everything would have been fine. But instead, she took this weird mistake that she made, and she piled another one on top of it, and another one, and another one, and another one, until she died. It's a big mistake to think that we can hide our sins with more sins. A mistake that can have serious consequences for us and for those around us until we realize that we cannot cover up our sins and we must rely on Jesus to cleanse our sins. I'm going to preach a sermon tonight that I've entitled The Cover-Up. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says, It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the rooftop in the king's house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, got David's attention. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent word to David and said, I am pregnant. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your presence tonight, God. We pray, Lord, that the words that come out of my mouth today, Lord, will not be of me but of you, God, that you would anoint the message that there is preached tonight, God, that you can touch each of one of us in this place, God. I come humbly before you, Lord, not by my talents and my abilities, but by your spirit within me, in Jesus' name, amen. So it's starting to look a little bit like a soap opera. <laughs> this guy's a king. I mean, you know the story. King David, first of all, should have been at war because his troops were at war, and traditionally the king goes with them. But he wasn't. He was at home messing around. And uh, what happens is he finds himself in quite the circumstances. <laughs> um, David messed up, and what he ends up doing is he ends up committing several more sins to try to cover up his original sin. Um, what happened is he finds out that Bathsheba's pregnant. This is a woman who's married to another man, a man who serves in his army, a high rank ser serves in his army. Um, so what he does is he doesn't just go, oh, dang, I messed up, time to confess, time to make things right. I'm going to be in a lot of trouble for this, but it's what I have to do. That's not what he did. So what did he do is he brought, um, he brought Uriah back from battle, and he, he, kind of framed it off as if he had some questions about the battle to ask Uriah, hey, how's the guys doing? How's everything going out there? You're doing a great job, buddy. And then he says, okay, you know what? Don't worry about heading back to the camp tonight. Just go home, wash up, hang out with your wife. Wink, wink, you know, that's what he's doing. He's trying to hang out with your wife and go home. He's trying to make it look like, you know, eh, the picture paints itself. So what Uriah does is he doesn't do that. He's a man of honor. He's a man of valor. He says, I can't go home and be with my wife while my brothers are out there on the battlefield. He slept in the king's court. He didn't go see his wife, and David finds out about this. And so what does he do? He calls Uriah to him again, says, you know what? Stay another night, have dinner, and David gets him drunk. And then he says, go home, spend another night with your wife, you know, acting like he didn't know. Go home, spend another white w night with your wife, and then return to the battlefield. Well, what happens? 
even though in his drunken state, he still is a man of honor and a man of valor, and he sleeps in the king's courts, and he does not return home. And David realizes, oh, crap, <laughs> what do I do now? So he brings him back one more time with a note. And he says, take this note to, uh, to, the, to the troop leader and, uh, and deliver it to him. Well, in that note was literally Uriah's own death sentence. In the note, King David wrote to him and said, go up to battle. And once the battle gets hot, you know, when things get crazy, withdraw everyone except Uriah and let him die. This is why they say he committed murder. And then so Uriah dies. Bathsheba's pregnant with what everybody assumes is Uriah's baby. And King David, being honorable man, takes the widow into his house and fathers the child, right? That's pretty dirty. So with his initial mess up, with his initial mess up, he got himself into so much more trouble, so much more trouble than if he had got right the first time. Now, he still would have been in trouble getting right the first time, don't get me wrong. But he continued to try to bury it. When we sin, God always gives us the opportunity to make it right. Now, I don't know what David's opportunity was to make it right in that particular circumstances. I don't believe Scripture really reveals that to us very clearly, but I guarantee you God gave him a chance. Sometimes we have a chance, and it looks like an impossible chance, but ultimately we tell the truth regardless of the circumstances. <coughs> Genesis 3, 8 through 9 is a good example of this. Um, shortly after Adam and Eve committed the first sin, um, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Of course, God knew where they were, and he knew exactly what they did. But he didn't say, hey, I see you behind that tree. Come out. I know what you did. He wasn't coming straight out to, to, to call them out for what they did. He gave them a chance to come clean. And instead they hid. They eventually came clean. And you guys know the rest of that story. But God gave them an opportunity to step forward and say, yep, we messed up. I don't know what to do now. So we then have to decide what to do. As we know from the story that I just told of David, he decided to further bury his situation in sin, trying to hide what he did from, from Israel and from God. Isaiah 29, 15 through 16 says, Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down, Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should be should say of its maker? He did not make me or the thing formed should say to the one who formed it. He has no understanding. God formed us. He made us. He knitted us together in our mother's womb. Scripture tells us this. Our sins cannot be hidden from God. We can't hide our sins from God. If we try to hide, we will be found out. So King David thinks he covered his tracks pretty well, right? He, he, I mean, he's obviously probably not feeling like a million bucks, but he thinks he's kind of coasting in the clear. He just got to deal with what's going on in his mind. I mean, obviously Bathsheba's a little bit in on it, but at the same time, she committed an adulterous act as well, so she's probably not talking. But he thinks he's good. He thinks he hid it from Israel. He thinks he hid it from um from God. In fact, he did hide it from Israel. Nobody's, nobody's really catching on to it at this point. Um, but God knows. We know that God knows. And, uh, and he gets exposed. In 2 Samuel uh, 12, 1 through 14, a little bit of reading here, so bear with me, um, is the story of, of the, the prophet Nathan coming to David and, and telling him, God knows what you did. And it says, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. But the rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe, a lamb. 
uh, which he had bought. And he, broke, uh, and he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. Uh, he used to eat of its morsel and drink, uh, it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came, uh, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or of his herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this, uh, has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And then Nathan says to David, he says, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave, uh, gave you the house of Israel of Judah and if as if this were too little, I would add to you so much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the, uh, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and you have taken the, uh, the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up, against, uh, rise up evil against you and out of your house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the, in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also put away your sin, you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child whom you have borne shall die. That's a powerful part of scripture. David gets found out. He gets his consequences dealt to him. Um, King David, like I said, had successfully hidden what he did to the public eye. Um, and he thought he could hide it from God. And he found out that he was wrong. And if you know the rest of King David's story, um, he had a lot of troubles with his children and kids doing crazy stuff and war. And I mean, the, he was a man of war until he died. Um, and this is because of things like this. God sees all that we do. And if we believe we can do anything good or bad with and hide it from God, we're mistaken. Luke 12, 2 through 3, Jesus says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or, or hidden that will not be uh, known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private, in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. God knows you. He already knows your every thought and your every action. There's nothing that we can truly do that God doesn't see. So we can't hide our sins from God. <laughs> Psalms 44, 20 through 21 says, If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would God not discover this? For he knows the secrets of our heart. And Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So if we can't hide anything from God, there's really no sense in it. And the reality is, if we don't hide anything from God, we unlock a whole new relationship with God, a whole new depths of intimacy with God, because he already knows our mess ups. He already knows our downfalls. He already knows our flaws. But when we come humbly before the Lord and confess our sins to him, there is healing. There's he healing, um, not just spiritually, but physically as well. It's an important part of spiritual healing is <clears throat> is confession of sins and anyway <laughs> I lost my thought there um an interesting example of that is as parents um oftentimes we catch our kids doing things they shouldn't be doing 
Um, in fact, just maybe three, four nights ago, there's this shell. Uh, you've seen our fireplace. We've got the mantle, and then there's a little shelf up above. There's a little shell up there. It's one of those shells you put up to your ear, and it sounds like the ocean. And it was right before bedtime, and he wanted to hear the ocean. He said, Dad, can I, hear the o- can I get the shell and hear the ocean? I said, not right now, bud. It's bedtime. We're trying to put the kids to bed. And then he says, okay, and then he runs off. And then we do a couple things, you know, we're getting ready for bed, and I walk in the living room, and he's standing on the mantle looking up at the shell. And I said, Jack, what are you doing? And he turns around and looks at me. He's all, he's busted. He knows he's busted. And at that point, he has a decision. Am I going to lie and say I'm doing something else, or am I going to come clean? And me as a father, when my kids come clean, I tend to have more mercy and grace on them. They might still have a consequence or a punishment, but that's how God is with us. If we come clean with God when, we, when we're caught red-handed and we're caught red-handed as soon as we do it, believe you me. Or if we try to hide it from God, the consequences build and they build and they're built just like the lady who swallowed the fly. Her sin built and built and built. The animal she ate built and built and built until it killed her. Proverbs 28.13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. And it can also, like I said earlier, it can bring physical healing. Um, James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. And you've seen it before if you've been in the fellowship long enough or um, even other churches that contend for healing. Um, oftentimes somebody will come up and they'll say, you know, oh, I've got uh, my, ba- my back hurts. And then the first thing the pastor does is he prays for them, you know, all that stuff. And if it doesn't work, what's the first thing they always say? Do you have anybody you're mad at? Do you, do you have any anything you're hiding? Is there anything you're holding back? Do you have greed, anger, all these things? Um, because they understand something. They understand that there is physical pain that can come from sins that we've harbored, that we haven't repented from. And let me tell you, repenting of your sins to Jesus is healing. It can bring a relief, not just in your spirit, but in your body. And it's a beautiful thing. God is gracious and he is merciful. But it's not just confessing our sins, but it's repenting as well. Going back to the story with Jack, um, if, if I had caught him in the action and he said, yeah, I was trying to get the shell. I'm sorry, Dad. And I said, it's okay, buddy. I forgive you. Don't do it again. Run along. So what if I come back in the room two minutes later and he's doing the same thing? Was he really sorry? What, what do his actions tell me? He was just trying to get out of trouble. He wasn't, he wasn't sorry. He wasn't trying to make anything right. He was just trying to get out of trouble. You see, in fact, Jesus says that repentance is a very important part of forgiveness. Um, in Luke 13, 1 through 5, it says, There were some present in that, uh, in that very time who told him about the Galileans whose, uh, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices which is just not a good thing. They messed up. That's the gist of it. And he answered them. Jesus says, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. For those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they are worse offenders than the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, repentance is the fruit of true remorse for our sins. Repentance is the genuine response to thankfulness, to the thankfulness of what Jesus did for us. You see, and the wonderful part is, is Jesus is eager to forgive us. He's anxious. He's sitting there waiting. He sees us dying in our sin. And he just wants us to come to him. He just wants us to say, Jesus, I messed up. God, help me. John 3.16 continues on a little bit more after that, believe it or not. You never hear any more past that, but I'm going to read a little more past that. John 3.16-18 through 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not, content, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Jesus came to redeem us. He did not come to condemn us. He didn't come and live a perfect life side by side with us just to say, Yo, you messed up there, too bad for you. Oh, you did that wrong. You should have done that better. Uh, uh, yep, saw that come in. And he didn't do that. I mean, of course, he did call out sin many times in, in the Gospels. We read that. But he always follows it up with grace, opportunities of repentance. Jesus came and lived with us dirty sinners so that he could save us from the sin that we were in. He told the adulterous woman, get up and sin no more. In other words, get up and repent because I've forgiven you. 1 John um, 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that great? I can't, couldn't possibly count all the mess ups I've had, and none of us here can. If we think we can, that's another mess up you can add to your list. <laughs> King David, as we talked about throughout this, um, throughout this message, had quite the string of sins piled on top of one another, trying to cover up his mistakes, trying to cover his tracks, but eventually he realized he was caught, and he realized it was time to repent to God and to make things right. And then there's a psalm, Psalm 51, is King David's prayer to God for forgiveness. Um, it's actually, part of it is the song we sang this morning, Psalms 51, 1 through 13. Excuse me, I will, I'll read it for you. I'm not going to sing it again, but I'll read it for you. It says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and in inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret, in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear, uh, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. It's hard not to sing that last part, <laughs> but I'll spare you guys. You see, King David was described by God himself as a man after God's own heart. He was known as one of the greatest men in the Bible, who God worked many miracles through and strengthened the people of Israel through. And King David was even in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came through the lineage of, of King David. That's an honor. <laughs> King David was used by God in these ways despite his egregious sin because he humbly repented before God who was eager and willing to forgive. And God is fully able and willing to do the same thing for us, for each and every one of us in this place and all these people out there. You see, at the end of that psalm, he says, Restore the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgress sorry, excuse me. I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. What he's saying is, God, forgive me, and, I'm gonna, and I'll tell people about you. That's part of repentance, is, is you not only just take your sin and you throw it in your past and you try your darndest not to do it again, although sometimes we do, we know that. But you push forward and you push forward in the name of God, and you tell people about his glory, about his forgiveness, about his grace. So the beautiful part about it is we can go from trying to cover up our sins, which we will never fully be able to do, 
We can go from trying to cover up our sins to being covered by the blood of Jesus and being cleansed from our sins. And that's the beautiful part about it. We can't make what we've done wrong right on our own. But thankfully, Jesus is faithful and he is true. And he is here to wipe clean what we've made a mess. Can I have every head bowed and every eyes closed?